I, I really want to talk about uh, the way in which we uh, talk about terroir today and a little bit about the um, concept of terroir because I think that uh, it's been uh, so abused as a marketing tool and so uh, uh, stretched and pulled in every direction that we, we risk uh, uh, not having a useful tool at all and uh, perhaps having to rename the uh, Congress. Um, so in my, my question is, you know, can, can the notion of terroir be a, really a, a useful conceptual tool? Can it be a unifying concept? Um, and especially, can it bridge the uh, conceptual gap between wine consumers and uh, wine growers on the one hand, and those of you here in my audience who are scientifically trained uh, and uh, uh, are trying to understand uh, uh, what makes uh, vines tick? There are uh, a, a few uh, particularly, uh, for me, annoying and unfortunate conceptual uh, confusions about terroir that I want to address here first. Um, there, there is the wonderful French notion of the vin de terroir. Um, it, it, it has its usefulness, but there's a great danger and a problem, it seems to me, in trying to define terroir to incorporate an evaluative uh, assumption. You know, this is, this is like the notion that we have terroir, all you have is dirt. You know, it's, it's sort of like we, we live in a neighborhood, you, you live someplace where there are a lot of houses and streets. Of course, in the eye of the beholder or the, or the nose of the taster, um, there is uh, good terroir or good, good sites and, and there are less good sites. And really what we're trying, if we're trying to use the concept of terroir to, as a unifying uh, notion for what makes the uh, site tick, then uh, it, it's no good if we already import uh, evaluative associations. You know, there's, I, I, I just said I wouldn't name specific names uh, of anybody here, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna stick to that. But I mean, there is at least one well-known wine uh, organization, internationally prestigious wine organization, that's, that swallowed this uh, evaluative notion uh, to such an extent that they, they essentially uh, try to explain that only when the site is really good does it have any influence on the flavor of the wine. Uh, so you, you can only put the name, for instance, of certain vineyards on, on a label because, not because they're better, but because other vineyards don't really influence the, the flavor of the wine. This seems to me, you know, as a basis for further discussion with people who are scientifically uh, trained, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a bad idea. Uh, and, 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 you know, apropos the discussion we were just uh, listening to about irrigation, um, great example. Uh, there is there is just a tempest in a teapot, or I suppose we should say in a wine glass. Uh, these days, the issue is: is terroir somehow incompatible with irrigation? Well, I mean, yeah. If you if you if by terroir you mean are good wines that are representative of a particular site uh, hostage to uh, irrigation? Uh, yeah, we can ask that question. But really, that's a, it's better to frame that as a question about what ground rules in the game with nature are we going to choose to permit or not permit? And uh, to confuse that with the issue of what is the influence of the, of the site seems to me a very uh, a bad idea. Uh, secondly, the, the, the other favor that a lot of uh, people think they're doing to terroir is to make the concept so inclusive that it really doesn't wall anything out anymore. And so you see this uh, slippery slope where uh, people, well, come on, we want to incorporate the vigneron in the terroir, and what about traditional tradition and history and, you know, before long it's such an amorphous concept that uh, unless it walls something in and walls something out, it, it's not really going to be useful as a, as, a, as a frame in which to, to discuss these issues scientifically. Um, and, and, I mean, I think if you look in the literature, even the scientific literature, you'll see uh, these, these, uh, this, this uh, um, importation of evaluative uh, connotations into the definition of terroir or the stretching of terroirs till, it, till it's uh, completely amorphous. You'll see this uh, all the time. Uh, so I, I'd like to propose in a very simple uh, uh, definition that terroir should be simply about the constraints that are imposed or the liberties that are afforded to a wine grower by the place in which the wines are grown. Uh, 
this is a simple tool, but it allows us, for instance, to talk intelligibly about quality, not just of sight, but also quality of, of wine grower, because after all, you, you have to measure a person's uh, uh, quality by the raw material with which they, uh, that, w that they have to work with. So uh, if, you, uh, if you have a fixed notion of, uh, of, the, of the contribution of the site, then you also have a means potentially of, of ranking sites and talking about uh, site potential. Um, now, I just want to propose uh, generally here, with the remainder of my time, um, a few ways in which the uh, consumer and, uh, and wine critic and uh, wine uh, grower, the non-scientist on the one hand and the, and the scientist can perhaps usefully collaborate. Um, the first thing is that I think uh, we have to be clear about the question that really interests the wine grower uh, or the uh, consumer or critic as it relates to the potential efficacy of, of, of the site. Um, what, what got me interested in wine and, uh, and what is the source of endless fascination is precisely the differences expressed from one place to another when you're growing the same grape. And especially you see this in, in places like the Willamette Valley or the Cote d'Or or, or, or German uh, recent growing regions with which I have a lot of familiarity. When you see that sometimes the wine tastes different from very common uh, uh, um, uh, clonal stock or, 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 or a similar genetic uh, mix and uh, grown by the same grower, uh, cheek by jowl, you can have uh, very different uh, manifestations in the, in the glass, very different organoleptic results. And, and this is, fascinates us, but also it's of course the basis for really centuries of wine appreciation. Uh, the notion that uh, you can't grow Clovugeau here. But on the other hand, you probably can't uh, grow in, in, in Burgundy what you can grow, uh, let's say, Warden Hill Road in Dundee. So the, the, the whole framework in which we uh, understand and appreciate wines is, is sort of tacitly based on this assumption that place does make a difference. Now, this might not be true, but uh, it, it seems to me that at least if we're going to address terroir scientifically, we have to, uh, we have to uh, respect the question. Um, and when you look at a lot of the accounts that are, uh, that are offered uh, scientifically, uh, they're, they're, they're often uh, insufficient to explain what we seem to believe as consumers, as, as wine growers, as critics, that we're able to perceive. You know, there are entire books written by geologists with terroir in the title, uh, giving us all sorts of interesting information about the geological minutia without, not only without offering any uh, connection to, uh, that, uh, that might explain why the, the underlying geology uh, influences the flavor of the wine, but also apparently without thinking that it's necessary to offer such an explanation. Obviously the geology is interesting in itself and uh, rocks are beautiful, but the question is, what does it have to do uh, with wine? And if you look at some of the, the popular models in which uh, viticulturalists, uh, the, 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 the framework in which, which viticulturalists, geologists, soil scientists, and others approach uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, issue that they call terroir, uh, in, in many cases, it seems to me, the, the, the models are simply insufficient to account for what it is that we as consumers, as wine growers, as critics think it, it is that we're tasting in the glass. I mean, for instance, there, there you frequently will encounter a model of uh, a plant physiology is, is sort of the model of uh, optimization, the idea that you know the plant is gonna, by God, figure out how to get what it needs nutrient-wise in order to survive in order to produce uh, fruit within the constraints of, of domestication. And uh, so it, it wouldn't do any good to talk about, you know, suppose this site has a, a particular uh, excess uh, of this mineral uh, deficiency or excess and another site has a, another deficiency or excess because in the end the plant's going to figure out how to get what it needs and at that point it's, 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 uh, it's uh, satisfied. Well, that may very well be the case, but then we can't really look to those uh, factors in order to try to explain what it is that makes wine from one place taste uh, seemingly so different from uh, wine in, in a neighboring place. Uh, 
an, an, another uh, very common uh, model uh, is simply to talk about uh, issues of what I would ha what I would call water management, the the, the retention and and uh, of, of water or the drainage, uh, and the physical properties of the soil and how this impacts the uh, the, the uh, water intake by the plant. Obviously, this is hugely important to how wine tastes. But if we look at the experiences that we have in many places, it does, doesn't seem sufficient to account for the remarkable differences in, in flavor. I mean, I, used to, I like to use favorite examples from the Mosul, where it's, you, know, you look up at that wall of slate and you think, well, you know, here we have all this oxidized red matter, and over here we have the uh, 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 you know, blue slate. It, it, it's, it doesn't really look like there could be enormous differences in the, in the drainage of this steer, uh, sheer rocky uh, stuff up there on the wall but you know you walk from one place to the other and then you taste the wine from one place and the place ne next to it and you get uh, you get a very different uh, result so again it may be the chemistry is not implicated but uh, I think that the uh, onus should be on anybody who thinks that they can explain these things entirely in terms of uh, of, uh, of uh, water um, and uh, uh, water management and the physical uh, properties uh, of the soil uh, on, now, on the other hand, uh, uh, although it's important that scientists have to respect the consumers uh, and, uh, and the growers and the others who, of us who think that we are tasting these differences, naturally uh, it's also very important to put, uh, to put us to the test, meaning not you as scientists but the rest of us, because we, uh, there, there are fortunately a lot of advances in sensory science and the psychology of, uh, of uh, taste and, uh, and the alleged terroir differences to the test. Uh, but again, here there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of disappointing uh, deficiency in the way that these things are discussed. There's a lot of, you know, very, uh, uh, on the part of scientists sometimes, a superficial assumption that you can't uh, actually taste these differences, which, uh, I mean, it, it, that might be the case, but let, let's just say, if you, if you can't have a, a, a vineyard character or a terroir character that you can taste, then by the same token you can't have vintage character or vintage uh, imprint on, on the wine because naturally there are all these other factors in terms of wine making that are that are hugely important and that are more obvious but the fact of the matter is that I'm pretty sure that I can identify uh, well I'm at Pinot's or uh, Mosul Rieslings by uh, vintage with a pretty good degree of accuracy and also uh, a lot of us think that we can uh, that we can identify specific sites um, but a, pr uh, a great example from Beaujolais which I like to, to use just to to, to uh, explain how we could be much more productive in, in, in putting these matters to the test. Uh, there's a dramatic difference between Gamay grown on granite and Gamay grown on, uh, on uh, very uh, high active lime uh, chalk clay uh, soils. And in the south of Beaujolais, in that vast area you saw just earlier on the map, called Appalachian Beaujolais, the, the, you have the one uh, next to the other, cheek by jowl. So rather than try to talk uh, in highfalutin terms about what it is we think we are tasting in the glass, I would propose simply, can we segregate bind a bunch of wines from, from this region of Gamay into those that are grown on granite and those that are grown on, on chalk? Um, I'm chocolate. I'm pretty confident that I can do that, and I certainly know there are a lot of growers who would be better at it than I am. So again, these are the kind of things that you know. If we want to introduce scientific rigor, uh, we need to do it in a in a, in a constructive way. Um, there, there are a lot of potential problems in the future. Uh, you know, as long as terroir uh, sells, and I mean, don't even get me started on the concept of minerality, which seems to me just to be a massive conceptual confusion between the vocabulary that we use to describe wines, on the other hand, and a picture that a lot of people make of, for themselves, on the other hand, of how uh, uh, wine tastes because of the alleged minerals being being sucked out of the soil uh, like a straw by the roots. But uh, you know, as long as these concepts sell. 
obviously there's going to be a large section of the of the trade and of wine growers that are going to be very satisfied but i don't think that that can satisfy uh, our our curiosity uh, and i have to say too as long as soil scientists geologists and viticultural advisors get paid high money to tell people about where where they think it would be a good idea to grow uh, uh, a certain vines or where to where to plant certain uh, material uh, they they may be perfectly happy even though they don't have an account of why it should make a difference of really why is the flavor uh, impacted. And uh, as, as long as there is, I'd say it, uh, as, as, as uh, one eminent enological professor told me years ago, there's no money, he said, you don't understand, there's no money for basic research. You know, there is plenty of money for how to, how to create, reach certain, uh, optimize certain uh, characteristics or, or, or quantifiable parameters in wine, but when it comes to que basic questions about what makes it tick and why it tastes the way it does, uh, you know, good luck uh, with the with the tin cup. But uh, so those are the challenges for the future. But I think that that we have to overcome them. And and I think that having a clean concept is uh, as a tool is at least a start in that direction. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>